Hi, I'm Sean Wildermuth. Welcome back to Coding Shorts. In today's episode, we're going to continue our story about middleware with a new piece of middleware in ASP.NET Core 7 called Output Caching. If you've done ASP.NET in the regular .NET framework, you're probably already familiar with it. I'm going to show you how it works and how it's different from some of the other caching mechanisms that we'll talk about. Let's get started. So here we are with a .NET project that I already have running. I don't have output caching added here. I don't have output caching added here whatsoever. But I'm going to add it. But first, let's see what this looks like when we actually run it. I'm going to go ahead and run it from the console. I'm going to run it from the console, and I'm just going to run it with Edge, just so we can see what it actually looks like. It's a small little project I have that takes a look at some movies and their statuses with the Bechtel test. Here's a regular Razor page, and we have another Razor page that we go to from it. Pretty simple. Now this Razor page may be kind of expensive to build. We can see actually how big it is. And so one of the things we might want to do is cache this page. This is also going to apply to APIs like films. This is an API that this support. And again, this is a huge list of items here. And we might want to cache these, especially if they aren't volatile at all. We even have support for caching individual years, like let's say 2005 for only the years that these pass. So we're gonna look at some ways that we can handle output caching, but let's talk about what it is first. When we look at something like, say our index.html page here, this is building up a page, and the result of this is being spit out into the response that then gets shipped back to the user. Now, if you watched my last video when we talked about response caching, you may think these are very much similar or the same thing. And there's a big difference here is that the response caching has some limits and is also expecting that the user, whether that's the browser or some app, is going to know to deal with how long an object expires. Still very useful, but if you've moved on to .NET 7 and we're working with .NET 7 Preview 6, we're gonna see that output caching is really server only. And this gives us more control over it. What we'd like to do is take this whole page and if someone requests it again, don't actually build this page with code. Just take that copy of the page and spit it back out in a short-lived cache. So let's start by adding the middleware. So if we open up program, we'll see that this is a pretty simple app. It has razor pages, it has controllers, and has minimal APIs. Now, this isn't typical. You're not gonna have all these, but I needed some sort of conceit in order to be able to show you how caching works really across these. But the first thing we need to do is add the services for caching. And it's just called add output cache. And we'll look later about maybe some ways to configure this, but for now, we're just gonna add the output cache to our project. And then down here, we're gonna to wanna to use the output caching. Now, the interesting part of this is that we need to have it before we get to some of these others. So typically it's going to be used either before routing or often you're gonna use it after authorization to make sure that someone doesn't actually get a thing that is cached before authorization is checked. So I'm gonna stick it right in here and say use output cache. And what we'll see if we look at this index again, we actually look at the code, we'll see that when this is executed, we're actually throwing out a log information. In fact, we can see it here, reading films, in this case, loading entire film list from the index model is what we wanna prevent, right? So let's restart this. If we come back over and refresh our page, we can see that it, the last thing it said was loading the entire film list. And if I refresh this, it shows it again. The point of that is that adding output caching doesn't do anything until you opt into it. It's not trying to guess what the right thing is to cache because it doesn't know implicitly the domain knowledge about whether something is volatile or not. 
For example, if the pricing information on Amazon were cached, it may only be cached for a very short amount of time, whereas the catalog itself, what products are out there, may be cached. Now, if you're Amazon, that's probably all very dynamic, but you can see that you need to understand where it makes good sense to add that. And in our case, this razor page is really pretty heavy. And if we're going back to a data store of some sort to get it, we're going to want to minimize that network round trip across the server. So let's turn on caching here. And all we need to do once we have it wired up in program.cs is say output cache, and you'll need to bring in the output caching namespace. So this page when it loads is going to be out cached after it's first loaded. We're not specifying any options at this point. Now, if we restart this and refresh our page, we can see it loaded the entire film list because the, the cache is only being used by default inside our process. But if we refresh again, no call to the entire film list. It's not being called. In fact, if I let's press it and refresh it several times, still only one. If we waited long enough, this would time out and it would go ahead and reload it. That way you're dealing with when you have heavy load on your server or servers, that they're going to get this cached copy, which it should, in theory, be easier to deliver than actually computing that page. Let's do the same thing for our API. So if we come down here into our program.cs, we have this simple API that gets films by year. We can see I'm calling reading from year minimal API, just so we can see that it's actually calling this. Now, attributes might work here if we wanted to put something like output cache, but it's still a little awkward. So in most of the cases with minimal APIs, it's going to be a fluent syntax. So here we're going to say cache output in order to add output caching to this particular minimal API. What's important to note here is that output caching really doesn't apply much like response caching doesn't for puts, posts, delete, even other verbs, because they're actually performing an action other than just looking at data that could be cached. And so let's take a look at this. Now that I've added that output cache there, let's go ahead and stop our project and rerun it. You can see we're doing this over and over again. And if we come back over here and do that API Films 2005, we can see that we are getting it. In fact, we can see here that's reading it from the minimal API. And if we refresh, no big surprise, we're not getting any new ones. But what's important here is that this cache is based on this URI. And so if I ask for a different year, let's say 2002, it's going to call it. But until the cache, but until the cache terminates, this will also be cached as a separate cached item. See, we're only getting 2002 and 2005. In fact, just to prove it, if I go back to 2005, we're still not getting it called again. And so the magic here really is, and it's important for you to get the idea, is caching is based on the URI, not on the object itself. So this cache output is not caching calls to this API, but caching calls that request a specific URI. So this could be called multiple times. And that's an important idea so that when a request comes in for a specific resource or URL, if you want to think about it in that way, that is what's being cached. Now, what about controllers? We've seen it in these two different cases. If we open up the controller, the controller is a little different in that this gives you more granularity to using output cache. We could certainly do, we could certainly still use the attribute just like we did in Razor Pages out, output cache. Let's bring in that same namespace we did before. And this will be cached, but we can also say output cache directly on the individual calls that you want cached. And so this gives you a little bit more flexibility as to how you want to handle that. So if we restart this and notice that this is just taking the film, the API slash films in this case. So this is not when we're specifying individual years. So we come back to films to get that huge list of films, right? We are returning the films from the controller like we expect and you shouldn't be surprised if I refresh it a couple of times. 
that this is not being called multiple times or only seeing it happen once because of that caching. So you've seen that you can use it in controllers, you can use it in minimal API, you can use it in Razor pages. And there's certainly other places like Blazor where you can probably use it as well. So we can control some of the things about how we want these caches to actually work. Now, one of the things I didn't show you earlier is that this in the controller actually has a Boolean that can be passed in that is a query string. It is not part of the actual route, right? Because it doesn't say anything here in get about passed. And so if we look at these films and say passed equals false, so it's only going to return us a list of the films that did not pass the Bechtel's test. We can see it returned films from controller. And if we refresh this, unsurprisingly, it doesn't call it again. But what happens if we change this to true? We're getting the right data and we got this called twice. And that's because by default, the caching is done based on the entire URL, including the query string. And this might be exactly what you want, but sometimes there's additional query strings that aren't about what is different. We can tell it to vary by certain query string parameters that we want. And so here we can say vary by headers, or in our case, we're going to use query strings. And this is going to be a new array of strings. In our case, we could put past, right? Now this won't have any change because we only have one parameter. But if you have multiple parameters, you may have other information that is not about how you're varying the data. Maybe information about where the URI came from or some other things that aren't really about caching it. And so you might want to only cache it based on certain query strings being different. One of the things that might not be obvious here is that this caching is being done by the, this middleware, of course, but we don't need to think about it as caching in each of those three areas. It's actually being cached using HTTP response. So we didn't want to worry about varying that cache everywhere. We could actually configure up at cache with a configuration object or options if you prefer, but I'll use configuration. And I'm going to add a base policy. And ACE, what base policy says is that this is going to be the policy for everything unless you specifically add, unless you explicitly turn it off. It's sort of reversing the head. And this policy is configured with a little builder object here that's being passed in. And with that builder, I can just say builder with to define output caches using a a function that will tell it whether to cache something or not. And we're going to want it to cache certain things. So I'm just going to call it R for request. And I'm going to look at HTTP context. And I'm going to use the request path to specify caching on all of my APIs. So in this case, I'll say starts with segments, API. So this is going to apply to all APIs everywhere in my system because we don't necessarily need to have that knowledge at the API. And the other piece I can do is specify how it expires this base policy. And so this is going to allow me to say, you know, I only want this to be cached for 60 seconds. This is where I can define how large that cache is. And because it's part of the base policy, this is only going to apply to anything that doesn't have a specific kind of caching specified. In fact, very commonly, you will also add policies for these specific conditions. So I'm going to call this our short cache. And just like the one we did before, I'm going to go ahead and use the builder. In this case, I'm only going to change the expiration, right? It'll be applied to anyone that's using this specific policy. And here I'm going to say time span from seconds, and I'm just going to say five seconds in this case. So there are some things I want to have a really short cache because it's a little volatile, but I want to be able to handle bursts, whereas I might want to have other default policies apply to everything. And so if we go back over to the controller, and I can specify the policy name by specifying short cache. And so here, this is not only going to cache it, 
and vary it by the query strings, but it's also going to use this policy that may have a number of things involved in it. But in our case, it just means a short cache. And so let's see what this looks like. Let me restart this. And over here, I'm gonna get the films where it passed, and I can see that it returned the films with the controller. So if I cat, so if I refresh it a few times, We'll see it doesn't handle it, but I only told it to cache for five seconds. Remember, this is a short cache. So that's why when we hit that five seconds, it actually called it again. And so this is just throttling how often you actually need to do it. So I hope you've learned sort of the tip of the spear of output caching as it's going to look in .NET 7. I think this is a good technology that we're finally bringing back from ASP.NET. It's sort of taken a little while for them to get to it. So I did want to warn you that this is based on a preview like I talked about earlier. But when we get to .NET 7, these concepts are going to be really important for you to use when you want to be able to deal with certain performance issues. The API in here, because it's based on a preview, may change over time. Hopefully it will all be fine. None of this will change, but there may be some inconsistencies. I will leave a link to this example as well so you can use it and run it. But it does require Visual Studio 2019, the preview, as well as preview six in order for this to work. Uh, though, as you can see in Visual Studio Code, as long as you have the SDK for seven installed, the preview, this should also work as well. If you've gotten this far, hopefully you've learned a few things. Don't forget to like and subscribe. That helps this channel quite a bit. And I hope that you found this useful. Till next time on Coding Shorts, my name is Sean Wildermuth.